What the Study Says. Welcome back to What the Study Says. I'm Dr. Kai. And I'm Dr. May. We're diving headfirst today into uh, the latest 2025 American Heart Association guidelines for CPR and emergency cardiovascular care. You know, the 2025 ACLS. Yeah, these guidelines drop every few years, and, well, they always shake things up a bit, don't they? This edition is definitely no exception. Right. It's not just tweaking protocols. It feels like a bigger shift, uh, maybe more towards really personalized evidence-based resuscitation. Exactly. So for you listening, the goal isn't just memorizing, like, compression depths again. It's about understanding the why behind the changes, the nuance. Totally. And there's some big surprises. Like, if you thought CPR for a drowning victim was always compression only, well, prepare for a major plot twist. Mm. It actually saves more lives. Mm. And we're going to talk about one drug. I mean, it's been used for over 140 years in critical situations. Right. And the guidelines are basically saying, whoa, let's pump the brakes here. The science behind it. Almost non-existent. Mm. It's pretty wild. So our mission today is to, you know, cut through all the dense material in the sources and pull out those key takeaways for you. Yeah, focusing on system changes, some tricky toxicity updates, yeah. and those really important special circumstances. We want you to walk away knowing what's fundamentally different in emergency care now. Okay, so let's start with the big picture, the philosophy. The chain of survival has always been the framework, right? Right. It started simple, like four links back in the 90s, then got more complex. Four different chains by 2020. So what's the headline change for 2025? Well, the biggest shift really is standardizing back to a single chain of survival for adults and kids outside of newborns, that is. And they've explicitly added a brand new final link. Recovery. Recovery. Huh. That sounds... <laughs> Significant. It implies way more than just getting someone out of the hospital. Oh, absolutely. It reframes the whole scope. Recovery can happen, you know, way after the actual arrest. It's long term. So how do the guidelines actually tackle that? I mean, mandating support long after the event seems logistically tricky. They formalize it. The idea is that survivorship has to be part of the emergency system itself. Uh, it means putting processes in place to assess neurologic, physical, psychosocial needs before discharge. Right. And then this is key reassessing after discharge, too. The system has to deal with ongoing issues. And it's not just the survivor, is it? The sources mentioned supporting co-survivors. Yes. That's another big step. Recognizing the impact on family, lay rescuers, even us healthcare providers, it acknowledges that whole Rickle effect. That's a huge um, ethical and systemic point. It is. And this focus on optimizing the system also ties into where patients go after ROSC after they get a pulse back. Ah, uh, the specialized centers. Right. The guidelines are reinforcing that getting patients to a specialized cardiac arrest center, or CAC, might be the way to go if comprehensive post-arrest care isn't available locally. So what makes a center a designated CAC? What do they need to have? Round-the-clock capabilities are key, specifically things like uh, temperature management, therapeutic hypothermia, and PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. Ready to go? Anytime. Kind of like our trauma or stroke center models then. Yeah. Regionalize the complex care. Exactly that. It's about getting the patient the best shot at a good neurological outcome. Okay. And speaking of specialized complex care, ECPR, extracorporeal CPR, that's resource intensive stuff, pricey. Are the guidelines still pushing for it? They're supporting it, but very carefully. It's about selection. ECPR, usually using VA ECMO for ECLS, is really for adults and kids where the cardiac arrest has a potentially reversible cause. Right. So the machine, the ECLS, buys you time to fix the root problem. Like what sort of causes? Things like anaphylaxis, uh, severe hypothermia, a massive pulmonary embolism, or maybe certain poisonings like really bad calcium channel blocker or beta blocker overdoses. Gotcha. But it's not a silver bullet for every arrest. Success really hinges on things like, you know, short, low flow times before getting on the pump and having that reversible cause you can actually target. Makes sense. Okay, that covers the big system stuff. Yeah. Let's shift to things we do right at the bedside. And I hear the guidelines are challenging a real oldie but goodie calcium for hyperkalemic arrest. Oh, this one is really eye-opening. I mean, for decades, giving IV calcium for high potassium has been absolute ACLS dogma. Stabilize that cardiac membrane, right? Standard practice, push calcium. Yeah, but when you actually look at the evidence the guidelines dug into, well, the foundation is incredibly shaky, like seriously weak. How shaky are we talking? Like 80s case reports. Try pre-World War One shaky. The sources point out the original benefit comes from an in vitro study from 1883. 1883. Yep. And a dog study from 1939, plus a few scattered case reports from the 60s. That's basically it. Wait, so 
we're basing a critical emergency intervention on cell studies done when, like, the Brooklyn Bridge was being built. It's right. Like, wow. It really puts the need for modern data into perspective, doesn't it? The guidelines flat out state there are no high-quality human observational studies supporting it. Not None. And worse, a recent uh, randomized controlled pig study showed no increase in getting a pulse back, ROSC, when they gave calcium in hyperkalemic arrest. Huh. So this sounds like a classic case of we've always done it this way, completely outrunning the actual science. Pretty much. The guidelines are basically saying, hey, let's acknowledge we don't really know if this helps. Even in kids, the analysis showed no real difference in survival. We urgently need good human trials here. Definitely. Okay, shifting gears to a more modern crisis. Opioids. Ah. Naloxone, obviously crucial. But the timing during CPR is tricky, right? You can't stop good compressions. What's the latest advice? So the guidelines make a really clear distinction. Scenario one, someone's in respiratory arrest, not breathing, but they do have a definite pulse. Okay, just respiratory arrest. In that case, lay rescuers, trained responders, should give naloxone. That's an active recommendation. Makes sense. But what if it's full cardiac arrest, no pulse, doing compressions? That's the critical difference. Rescuers should not delay starting CPR or calling for help just to give naloxone or wait for it to work. Priority is compressions. Absolutely. For actual cardiac arrest, giving naloxone might be reasonable, but only if it doesn't mess with delivering high-quality CPR, the compressions, and breaths. Compressions come first, period. Got it. Clear priority. Oh. Okay, one more toxicity update, cocaine poisoning. That can cause some nasty heart issues and high blood pressure emergencies. Is there a definite don't do this? Yes, a very important warning. For kids specifically, if they have cocaine-induced coronary artery spasm or a hypertensive emergency, you should not give beta blockers. No beta blockers for cocaine toxicity in kids. Right. The guidelines listed as class 3 no benefit. It could actually make things worse, worsen the hypertension, clamp down those coronary arteries even more. Big danger there. Okay, really good to know. Let's move to some of the physical hands-on changes, starting with that drowning reversal you mentioned earlier. This seems like a big shift in public messaging, too. It is, and it's purely based on physiology. Most cardiac arrests from drowning happen because of hypoxia, lack of oxygen. It's a breathing problem first. So multiple large studies now clearly show better outcomes when CPR includes breaths conventional CPR, compressions, and breaths. That outcome difference must be pretty stark to make such a clear change. It's compelling. The data suggests just giving breaths early, interrupting that drowning process, cuts the death rate dramatically. Nah. Like 44% mortality versus a shocking 93% if it goes to full cardiac arrest needing CPR. Wow, 93%. Okay. So while compression only is still way better than nothing if someone just won't or can't do breaths, right. conventional CPR with breaths is definitely the recommended approach for drowning. Clear message for drowning, breaths matter. A lot. Okay, next, uh, special population, uh, pregnancy. Cardiac arrest during pregnancy needs specific handling. I heard there's new terminology. Yeah, they're recommending we use the term resuscitative delivery now instead of the older paramortem cesarean delivery. Resuscitative delivery. Why uh, the change? It better reflects the purpose of the C-section in this context. The primary goal isn't just about the baby. It's about resuscitating the mother by getting that heavy uterus off her major blood vessels, the aorta and vena cava. Ah, uh, relieving that aorta cava compression. Yeah. Okay. And speaking of that, the positioning, there used to be confusion about tilting the whole patient versus just moving the uterus. What's the standard now? It's much clearer. The recommendation is manual left lateral uterine displacement, basically, using your hands to physically push the uterus to the left side. While the patient is flat. Exactly. While keeping the patient supine, flat on their back, for high-quality chest compressions, studies show this combo supine compressions plus manual uterine displacement works better than trying to tilt the whole body, which is awkward and often leads to worse compressions. Okay, supine with manual displacement. Good. Now let's talk environmental severe hypothermia. If someone needs ECLS, ECMO, for rewarming, is there an ideal speed? Yes, and the data is pretty specific now. It turns out slower is better for the brain. Rewarming rates less than 5 degrees Celsius per hour, that's about 9 sharing height per hour, were linked to much better odds, like 2.4 times better odds, of neurologically intact survival. Less than 5 degrees C per hour, so going faster is actually harmful. It seems so. Rushing the rewarming on ECLS appears detrimental to neurological outcome. Slow and steady wins the race here. Interesting. And what about drugs during severe hypothermia, like epinephrine? If the heart stopped, we instinctively want to give epi 
but the guidelines urge caution. Yeah, the optimal timing and dose of epi in really cold patients, adults or kids, is basically unknown. The big worry is slowed metabolism. Because they're so cold. Right. The body just isn't breaking down drugs like normal. So if you keep giving standard epi doses, the drug could build up to toxic levels as the patient starts to rewarm. The usual approach is often to hold off on meds or give them much less frequently until they reach a certain core temperature. Okay, another case where standard protocols don't apply. Last one. Patients with LVADs left ventricular assist devices. There was always this fear, right, that doing chest compressions would break the pump. Huge fear, lots of hesitation historically. So what's the verdict now, compress or not? Compress. The guidelines are very firm on this. The benefit of immediate chest compressions massively outweighs the risk of damaging the device. Really? Yes. For anyone unresponsive with an LVAD and signs of poor perfusion, you start CPR unless, you know, they can do an emergency re-sternotomy right there, which mm. is rare. Studies even looked at LVADs after people got hours of CPR and found the devices were usually still in the right place. So don't let the LVAD stop you from doing life-saving CPR. Absolutely not. The risk of not doing CPR is far greater. So if we zoom out and synthesize all this from the 2025 guidelines, what we're really seeing is a big push towards um, more nuanced, more specialized, evidence-based resuscitation. Yeah, less one-size-fits-all. Exactly. Moving away from just rigid protocols and really recognizing the unique physiology in special situations like toxins needing ECLS or finally questioning that ancient calcium practice. It demands more critical thinking, applying the right therapy at the right time. It really feels like emergency care evolving from broad strokes to much finer targeted interventions. And looking ahead, the guidelines even touch on technology, right? predicting problems before the arrest happens. That's right. The source materials talk about the rise of AI and machine learning, algorithms being developed to predict when a patient might deteriorate, potentially catching it earlier than our current early warning scores. Using AI to spot subtle patterns humans might miss. That's the hope. These tools could analyze complex data streams. That brings up a really important consideration, doesn't it? Something we want to leave you, the listener, thinking about today. Definitely. As these powerful AI tools get developed, how do we make sure they're intentionally designed to reduce health disparities? We know current systems sometimes reflect biases baked into the data they learn from. Right. How do we prevent these new technologies from oh, accidentally sure. locking in the structural inequities that already exist in healthcare instead of helping us overcome them? That's the crucial ethical question we absolutely have to tackle as we bring AI into the clinical world. A really important thought to ponder. Well, thank you for joining us for this deep dive into the 2025 ACLS updates. We hope you found it useful. Yeah, hope it helps you integrate these changes into your practice or understanding. If you did find this valuable, please subscribe and share the channel. We'll see you next time on What the Study Says.